You know, I'm a child of the Great Migration. Uh, I was born in 1944 in Alexandria, Louisiana, and my parents decided when I was three years old that they were going to become part of that movement of African Americans from the South to the North, uh, really a pilgrimage of sort because they left everything behind and they stepped out kind of on faith and they moved up to Buffalo from Alexandria along with my five brothers and sister. And um, we moved in with our aunt uh, over on the east side or downtown side, actually of Buffalo, New York, into what was called a cold water flat because there was no hot water. And as a matter of fact, there was no bathroom. We had a toilet in the hallway that was shared with the neighbor behind us. And um, there were 10 of us with my aunt and her daughter and her husband all living in a two bedroom, small, 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 small apartment. But we didn't really suffer. I don't think we suffered at all. I mean, certainly my parents made sure the children didn't suffer. And we had that living arrangement for about a year uh, until my father got a job and could get on his feet and be able to support us. Um, you know, that's a period in time um, where many of the people who were part of that movement are no longer with us. And it's an important period that we really need to talk more about because maybe about six million, I think, African Americans moved from the South to the North in that movement. And it was a tremendous historic feat. And it really showed how we as a people are perseverant, how um, you know we are survivors because we survived the South and we survived the discrimination in the North and we prospered. So I have to thank my parents for really um, being a, for, uh, not adventurous, but you know, being daring more or less to, to um, bring us to the North uh, for what they hoped would be a better life. Uh, my father became a photographer. Once uh, we moved here, uh, he learned that craft uh, from uh, someone else, I believe, but he perfected it on his own. He was a self-learner, a self-taught uh, person, not only um, with photography, but he also was a minister uh, and uh, he was a musician. He played piano and organ and he uh, uh, had a day job where he worked at the Chevy plant to take care of all these children. Because there were four children born after they came to Buffalo. Uh, so there were nine of us all together uh, and uh, parents made sure that we never felt deprived or suffered, what have you. Um, I also have to credit my mother. She was a homemaker uh, and she put her children first. Uh, she made sure that we went to church. Uh, my father, as a minister, was an associate pastor at St. John's Baptist Church. And that's where really a lot of our social life was centered, was around the church. Um, we lived only about a block and a half from St. John's at that time, which was on Sycamore. Uh, and uh, we went to church on Sunday, uh, morning, Sunday school, church, afternoon, Sunday program, sometimes evening, Sunday. So as I said, the church was really the center of our, of our life. Um, for 10 years, we lived on Walnut Street. Uh, and when I was 13 or so, my parents uh, and my aunt decided that they were going to move over in the fruit belt. They bought a house. Uh, my aunt stayed upstairs in the apartment. My father was downstairs and the rest of us were downstairs. And um, the house had hot running water and a bathroom that was inside with a tub, no less. And we thought we had died and gone to heaven, maybe. But at any rate, you know, uh, I had a solid, solid um, family life growing up parents who loved me, parents who loved um, our siblings, uh, siblings who loved each other. And um, there certainly is much more to tell about that, but that's the foundation of who I am and what influenced my life as I'm growing up. Well, we don't have enough time really, I guess, to talk about some of the, the other um, aspects and some of the other activities I've been involved in, but I would say the the um, founding, the co-founding of the Uncrowned Queens uh, Institute for Research and Education on Women, along with my colleague, Peggy Brooks Bertram. Um, what that experience has taught me 
is how much or how little we don't know about our own history and how we have been so enriched by our ancestors and not just our ancestors because right up to the present day there are men and women in this community and throughout this country who are who are community builders the reason we got the phrase is when we started looking at the histories of african-american women and men we found that there were so many of them who were instrumental in building the community and building organizations uh, and contributing to their churches and contributing to um, not just organizations for colored people alone, but organizations that benefited the entire community, like the American Red Cross or the American Heart Association or United Way. And nobody was recording those histories. Those histories were being lost. And so what we have been doing for over 20 years now is trying to make sure that we unearth the histories that are unknown, that we preserve the histories um, that we have and that we find, that we expand on the information about individuals in the community because um, the fact of the matter is that we are not very good sometimes in, in capturing our own history. And we need the children to understand that um, they really do stand on the shoulders of people who went before them. So often people throw out that cliche, we're standing on the shoulders and they don't really understand that they are really standing and building on the work that our ancestors and our current ancestors <laughs> leave, have left for us. So being able to find that history, being able to write it up, being able to record it and make sure that it's not lost uh, has been really, um, I feel one of the highlights of my life. It has enriched me, enriched my understanding uh, of our people and the histories that we have. And it's ongoing because there are many, many people who are kind of in the shadows. Even those people who may have been well known at one time don't have written histories. So if you don't have a written history, you, 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 know, you don't have anything that you can pass down to someone else to know who you were and to know what you did. Um, the Uncrowned Queens has really enriched me as an individual, as well as I hope having added to the enrichment of our community and the understanding of the history and the legacies that our people leave. Well, I think the major challenges certainly have been um, discrimination. I mean, as, as an African-American female, and you know, very often we don't understand that because we are complex individuals that have um, different identities, so to speak. I'm African-American, I'm a female, I'm a female of a certain age at this point in my life. And all of those um, identities um, together have created um, uh, barriers or created opportunities, if you would, um, for me and others to be discriminated against. So when we think about um, how we need to, uh, how do I put this? Um, what has been uh, a, a barrier or a challenge for us, it's understanding that at times your, your lack of success, your lack of, uh, of, um, of uh, being able to achieve your goals is not simply a matter of your own incompetence. Sometimes it's a matter of, of um, the racism, uh, overt or not overt, that you experience in your life because of your race, because of your sex, because of your age, because you know of, of um, aspects that people do not um, really appreciate. Um, this is really becoming even more of a problem today as we see all of the divisiveness in this, in this country. And so for young people, it's gonna be um, an even higher barrier to overcome, I think, than when I was growing up. I'm going to go back to education, and I, I think some of our other guests have said the same thing. When you think about, again, history and educating ourselves 
as to the history of our people and how it provides examples for us to overcome. Think about the fact that, and it really wasn't that long ago, 100, 150 years ago, when our people could not learn, could not be taught to read. They faced not just discrimination, they faced death uh, as a result of not being able to read. Not being able to read means that you, you lose out on so many things, so many abilities, so many avenues and opportunities to enrich your life. And so even now, um, because of that experience, African-American people valued education. They saw education as the way to get ahead. They saw it as the key to a better life. It's still the key to a better life. We understand that. So it's education, education, education. Not just English, not just math, but anything that enriches you, that expands your knowledge, that makes you a whole individual who can take all of that and become someone who is a critical thinker. That's what we need is to have individuals who are critical thinkers, who use their education as the base to develop that, that um, knowledge and develop that um, uh, skill of understanding how to look at things. So, um, you know, again, I would say to young people, get your education, know your history, appreciate your history because it will enrich you, uh, it will inspire you to reach for greater heights. And remember that, um, you know, that those who came before you, again, if we go back to the cliche about standing on other people's shoulders and the, about our ancestors being our foundation for that, what, what helped them and what made it possible for them to build the foundation was that they valued education and they ensured that they got that education, even if it meant um, that it was a threat to their survival, a threat to their very lives. Oh, wow, you asked the bombshell question. <laughs> well, the passion comes from, uh, I think, I didn't really begin to understand the history of black people until I was probably in my 50s almost, I think. And I was overcome by the fact that um, I was an educated woman. I had uh, degrees, um, but I was missing out on a major historic foundation um, for me as a person, uh, for my community. Um, in, and actually, you know, when we talk about uh, African-American history being American history, it's true. So we really should be celebrating African-American history throughout the year, not just in February. But it became apparent to me that um, we were missing uh, a foundational piece of our history because we only knew um, some facts about individuals. Some of it we didn't know at all. But if we knew that um, there was an and first, a first African-American teacher, we knew her name, but we didn't see her as a person. We didn't know who she was as a person. How did she get to the point of being the first African-American teacher? That doesn't inspire me to know that she was the first. It inspires me to know that she had a lot of obstacles to overcome, that she had a community that supported her and nurtured her. And that's the lesson, that's the piece that then makes sense about being standing on the shoulders of others. Then you understand that this person went through something to get where she got, and I can do the same. So my passion comes from wanting young people, especially African-American young people, to understand that their history is more than about the, the 20 facts of African-American history in February that you get to learn in those 20, not even 28 days, but 20 days maybe devoted out of those 28 days to black history. So that keeps me going and inspires me personally uh, and, and I hope to inspire others. Um, as far as 
what this does for the community, why the community should understand this. Um, again, for that very reason is that um, so very often that what is focused in on the African American community are the negatives. It's a lot easier to focus in on a negative than it is about a positive. So we need to flip the script on that. We need to flip it and we need to say, let's look at what's positively happening because that again is uplifting. That's not downtrodden. And, and this history, once you understand the length and the breadth of it, then you can be buoyed up by the positives. The negatives are there too. There's, there's no denying that, but you have to also understand that there's a reason for those negatives. And once you understand the reasonings, there's a little bit easier to, to um, you know, dis dismiss them um, because you understand what has led to those. Um, no, it's my hope that, that um, this project, again, illuminates and uh, expands on um, the, the reasons why of um, preserving a community's history as we have been doing is important. I think, as I said earlier, there were some significant African-American uh, community builders throughout the, the, the 300 years or so uh, that of this community once it became a, Buffalo became a town and a city. Um, but that history, um, you know, again, has been lost. It's been truncated and shrunk down to a uh, fact, one fact or another fact. It's broader than that. And I would think that, again, um, it would be important uh, and to everyone to have a holistic view of what this community has been, of what has been the foundation of this community, who have been the foundation of this community and passing that on to our children so they have a, a better understanding of who they are and what has contributed to their lives. Well, again, you know, foundations um, or businesses and all are part of the community. You know, they don't stand alone um, and they should reflect the community. Uh, in the kinds of things that they're doing, particularly, um, you know, more organizations, more foundations, more businesses have become um, aware of the importance of a community to their very business plan. And diversity, you know, is not just a word uh, these days that it really has a meaning and, and, uh, and there's understanding that in order to be a representative of a community that you want to serve, that you want to sell to, you know, that you want to buy your product or buy your ideas, that you have to go to that community, engage that community in the process because better understanding of what the needs of that community are makes it easier for that organization, for that corporation or business to provide their services to the community. So, you know, just from a standpoint of how does it enrich a business? It enriches a business because the diversity and the inclusion uh, are important to reach out and engage uh, a community that you want to serve.